Okay, uh, good evening. And I think good morning for those in Asia. And I hope that uh, uh, you're safe and doing well, especially uh, those in China under the pandemic control. I'm Gyuk Shin, <clears throat> in a director of Australian Stein, uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research Center. I'm really happy to welcome all of you to our seminar today on uh, decoupling uh, gender injustice in China's divorce court. Okay, this is part of a uh, seminar series that we offer this quarter under the theme of uh, negotiating women's rights and gender equality in Asia. In this series, we are looking at uh, women's rights and the diversity and complexity of gender issues in contemporary Asia. So next one is on uh, Southeast Asia, uh, one week uh, from today. Okay, now our focus today is on China. I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Jin Oi. Uh, as you know, well, uh, Professor Oi is a professor of political science and directs our China program, among many other things. So Jin will introduce our speaker today and moderate uh, the panel. So once again, uh, welcome to our seminar and hope you enjoy today's uh, discussions. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Giwok. And uh, for the China program contribution to this series, very important series, we're very delighted to have uh, Ethan Michelson with us, uh, who will provide, as you'll see, a very deeply researched empirical study on the difficulties that women face in trying to obtain divorce in China. And he uses big data computational techniques to uh, scrutinize the cases that he's going to be covering. And this is quite impressive. He's covering the period 2009 to 2016. And he's looking at the cases in all 252 basic level courts in two Chinese provinces, Henan and Zhejiang. And if I'm not mistaken, this is something like 150,000 uh, divorce trial records. So um, with that, he's going to be looking at both the institutional sources of China's clampdown on divorce, as well as the impact on um, the uh, for 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 the women um, and their families um, uh, with these decisions. Um, let me just say a few words about Ethan. He um, got his BA. He's Canadian, I believe. He got his BA in Asian Studies and Sociology. Uh, from McGill University, and he earned his MA and PhD at the University of Chicago, where he was um, a prize student of Bill Parrish's. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he's been at Indiana um, ever since, and he now wears many hats. He is the James and Noriko Gaines Department Chair in East Asian Languages, and I'm proud to say I'm actually a graduate of that department. So it gives me double pleasure to be introducing um, Ethan. Um, he is also a professor of sociology, but he is also has an appointment as professor of sociology and law at the Maurer School of Law at Indiana. And Ethan is one of the um, sociologists who has spent a considerable amount of his time. I think it's something like a quarter of his 25 years in the profession. He's either been studying, doing research or field and, and field work in China. And I think that all that time and work in China has really paid off. He's, um, his work on Chinese lawyers and social conflict in rural China has won numerous awards. Um, he's published in sociology journals, leading sociology journals, as well as places like China Quarterly, Law and Society, um, Journal of Conflict Resolution. And today, he, I want to congratulate him because um, his book, uh, from which he's going to be talking today, just came out last well, in March um, uh, with Cambridge University Press with the same title, Decoupling Gender Injustice in China's Divorce Courts. Uh, before I turn it over to Ethan, I just want to say that we will, we should have some time uh, for some questions 
after um, Professor Michelson's presentation. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and I will curate the questions for Ethan after his talk. So with that, Ethan, I turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. Um, it's, it's really great to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's a delight to, um, to talk about my, my book. Um, I, I, I feel like your introduction was, was so comprehensive that we can almost skip straight to the Q&A. <laughs> Um, but um, but I'll, I'll race through my, uh, my presentation um, with the goal of leaving enough time um, for, for questions um, and, and discussion. Thank you also to, to Giwok for, um, for hosting um, me and to, uh, and to Wena for, for setting this up. Um, let me share my, my screen now and hopefully you can see the um, uh, the cover of the um, of the book, which, um, by the way, is available online, um, open access. So if you're okay reading the e edition and ebook, it's it's freely downloadable. So you don't have to pay the uh, 155 dollar um, sticker okay. price for the the hardcover edition. I imagine the paperback, when it eventually comes out in a, a year, a year and a half, will be quite expensive as well. Um, although the title doesn't say so, this book is about domestic violence, um, very much about that. It's specifically about women's struggles to divorce their abusive husbands. Um, and the basic issue, is, as Jean mentioned, is that judges tend to deny divorce petitions in an almost uniform manner, regardless of whether they involve domestic violence. So this is also kind of a trigger warning. I'm gonna be discussing some, some pretty disturbing um, stuff. So in, in, in case anybody in the audience wants to reconsider um, attending this. Um, so um, here we are in California, or at least I'm pretending to be in, in California from my, my background. I'm actually in Bloomington, uh, Indiana, but California is where the no fault revolution began. Uh, in the United States back in 1969, which um, incidentally is the year uh, in which I was born. Um, according to, to no-fault divorce law, which uh, pretty much everybody knows, wanting out of a marriage is sufficient grounds for obtaining a divorce. You just have to tell a judge that you don't, you don't get along with your spouse, that differences between you and your spouse are irreconcilable, um, and that's enough. Um, but what if, what if your spouse is unwilling um, to divorce? Um, according to US no-fault divorce laws and practices, um, your spouse's opinion doesn't matter. Um, in fact, a disagreement between spouses about whether differences are truly irreconcilable is itself proof of irreconcilable differences. Um, in, in China, as we'll see, things are, are very different. Um, Chinese judges, you know, there is something analogous to no-fault divorce law in, in China, um, but judge, it's actually very difficult to persuade judges that differences are truly irreconcilable. Um, so uh, I, I, let me explain the meaning of the word decoupling. I'll come back to that shortly, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with a primer on relevant Chinese law. I mean, basically, the point uh, I want to make very quickly is that the laws um, on the books in China, you know, China's family laws and official commitments to protecting women are, are very impressive. Uh, there's an entire chapter in the book, chapter two, which I title The Right to Decouple. So that, that gives you a sense of one meaning of the, the word decoupling in the title. Um, it, it refers to marital decoupling, um, which sociologists sometimes call uncoupling. Um, the, the, um, the 1950 marriage law was the first body of law enacted by the, um, the People's Republic. Um, and when this happened, the freedom of divorce was enshrined as a foundational national principle. Um, and, and of course, it, and it, it goes back even, even further, um, back to the 1930s. Um, the, uh, the freedom of divorce and gender equality, of course, are foundational principles, not just in China, but in the communist world uh, more generally. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, even before uh, China's 2015 anti-domestic law took effect um, in March 2016, there was a huge arsenal of laws in China designed to combat and punish um, domestic uh, violence. Um, China's commitments to upholding global legal norms um, are also seen in its signing all core international human rights treaties and particularly noteworthy 
um, is, is it's um, you know, signing and ratifying CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination uh, Against Women. Um, there's the, uh, the, the well-known 1995 um, Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which um, followed the 1994 uh, uh, Beijing well, Women's Conference. Um, there are all kinds of other mechanisms as well, public security administrative punishment, um, and uh, a, a relatively new, well, newer um, domestic violence warning system uh, designed to offer uh, protection um, to, to women. So the book um, shows how all of these things are totally decoupled from judicial practices. And that, so that's a, a second meaning of the word decoupling in the title. So it, it refers also to institutional decoupling, uh, which social, sociologists um, sometimes call loose coupling. Um, in the um, quoting from the title of chapter three, um, court behavior is decoupled from the right to decouple. So if everything we knew about divorce litigation in China were from the laws themselves, um, we'd have a very distorted picture of what's going on. Um, in the divorce litigation process, courts ignore, sideline, and even subvert the very legal principles of divorce rights and gender equality that they symbolically embrace. And so this, this is the meaning of institutional um, decoupling. Um, the rules of evidence um, as well, um, I'll return to that shortly. Um, but um, so the, the, um, the key provision in the marriage law um, going all the way back to 1980 um, is, uh, is, is this, let me see if I can, if I can uh, circle this with the pen. So this thing, oh, that's showing the laser pointer. So um, there we go. So this, this part here, um, the language in what you see on the slide right now is from article 32 of the 2001 version of the marriage law. But what I've circled in red um, also appeared, it was introduced in our, as Article 25 in the 1980 um, version of, of the marriage law. And, and as you can see, it's very similar to the no-fault divorce doctrine that we're very familiar uh, with. It was intended to help people get out of unhappy marriages and therefore to support ex parte or unilateral divorce on the basis of irreconcilable uh, differences. So judges um, are supposed to grant divorce petitions when mediated reconciliation fails um, and, um, and the plaintiff insists on divorcing, regardless of what the defendant, you know, the other spouse um, thinks. So this is, this is the provision on mutual affection, the breakdown of mutual affection, ganxin po lian. But there's another part. So the following below this part, the, this list of bad behavior uh, or wrongdoing, so the, the first part, right, is the kind of the, the, the no-fault doctrine. The list here below is the fault-based um, doctrine. Um, judges are also supposed to grant divorce petitions on the basis of statutory wrongdoing. So basically, if someone commits wrongdoing, the presumption, the legal presumption should be the breakdown of mutual affection or irreconcilable difference, dif differences. And of course, this is supported by uh, the 2015 anti-domestic uh, violence law and all the supporting laws and regulations um, that I that I listed uh, uh, earlier. Um, there's an, another way to um, uh, another standard, sort of a third legal standard, is um, uh, physical separation um, for a full um, two years. Um, but the the point, um, you know, the the key takeaway from my analysis of of um, uh, almost 150,000 um, written divorce decisions is that claims of wrongdoing and physical separation, so the, the, the second and the third um, standard on the list here, no matter how well supported they are with evidence, they rarely carry the day. No matter how well plaintiffs document their allegations of wrongdoing with evidence, judges tend to say, well, yes, this is all very bad. It's all very bad behavior. Your husband has, has abused you. We, we get that, we recognize that, but you still haven't proven the breakdown of mutual affection. Uh, judges tend to act in a paternalistic manner with um, patronizing relationship advice of zero legal relevance. They, they infantilize litigants by acting as if they know what's best for them. 
Uh, court decisions are bursting with hackneyed cliches written by paternalistic judges um, professing to know better than the plaintiffs themselves and imploring plaintiffs to treasure the toxic marriages that they are desperate uh, to exit. So how on earth do judges get away with this? How do they square this legal circle you know, of, you know, on the one hand, recognizing fault uh, and wrongdoing that should be grounds for divorce, but at, at, on the other hand, um, and at the same time, um, claiming that the that mutual affection has not broken down, and that they and that plaintiffs have therefore not met the legal standard for for divorce. One one way they get away with this um, is on the basis of a 1989 Supreme People's Court judicial interpretation. Um, this one here: several concrete opinions on how to determine in divorce trials whether marital affection has indeed broken down. Um, um, basically, I mean, this, this thing was introduced because the breakdown of mutual affection standard was, was quite confusing to judges. Um, they, 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 they had, you know, it was, they found it subjective and kind of and vague and ambiguous. And so the Supreme People's Court issued this um, judicial interpretation to provide guidance to help judges. Um, and, and what it's done is it's, it's um, actually given judges almost limited discretion, unlimited, I should say, um, discretion to deny divorce requests by affirming the existence of reconciliation potential, and therefore by disaffirming the breakdown of mutual affection. Um, so in other words, you know, in, in essence, judges deny divorce petitions simply on the grounds or really on the pretext that the marriage has not fallen apart and that the couple can still patch things up. Um, the, the judicial interpretation calls on judges to conduct a comprehensive analysis of the marriage's foundation, um, post-marital affection, grounds for divorce, the current state of marital relations, reconciliation potential, that's really key, and other aspects when determining whether marital affection has indeed broken down. They, um, they therefore um, rule on divorce petitions according to unknowable hypothetical future counter, counterfactuals, basically like what if scenarios. Um, they say, well, if you guys work on your communication skills, if you guys just try harder, um, if you just you know, change your perspective um, and, uh, and, and learn to compromise and give and take and to, and to treasure uh, your marriage, you can totally patch things up. You can totally reconcile um, and, 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 uh, and therefore, because you have reconciliation potential, um, marital affection has not truly or totally broken down and you have failed to meet the standard for divorce. Um, and I'm hereby denying uh, the uh, plaintiff's petition. So this is what um, Chinese judges call the five consideration or five things to look at, you know, the wukan, they, they, they look at the, marital found, the marriage's foundation, all the things I just listed, but the reconciliation potential is, is um, is probably the most important thing, the thing that judges, it's, it's judges' best friend, um, really. So in essence, um, they, they gaslight plaintiffs. This is what judges do. They gaslight plaintiffs um, who came in making claims of, of, of abuse, domestic violence. Um, and their understanding is that you know, they've been abused, that their husband's um, behavior is, is, uh, is intolerable and unlawful. Um, and and uh, when they present their evidence, and they, and they often come in with a very compelling, uh, uh, you know, evidence that should be admitted and should be um, uh, uh, affirmed by judges um, to uh, to support their their claims, they find judges will just sort of sideline. And I mean, they may affirm the evidence, um, they may admit the evidence, but they will sideline, downplay, and trivialize. Um, the domestic violence allegations. They'll say, yeah, he beat you, um, but he still loves you. And because he still loves you and, and he's not willing to divorce, he withholds his consent to divorce and is seeking your forgiveness and, and another chance. Um, mutual affection has therefore not broken down. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, kind of a, a um, you know, textbook um, illustration or example of, of gaslighting, right? Um, kind of reframing or redefining or, or transforming what, what plaintiffs um, understand to be intolerable and unlawful, unlawful abuse as just 
innocent misunderstandings and, and mistakes on the part of caring husbands um, who, who actually love them and want another chance. Um, and, and, this, and judges, you know, by doing this, call plaintiffs, kind of they, they, they um, uh, call into question plaintiffs' sense of, of reality. And they, um, you know, and judges will often, often say, you know, for, for the sake of your children, for the sake of your family, um, even for the sake of the nation, um, and they use the same kind of strategy to ignore China's laws of evidence. Um, so standards of evidence are, are different in domestic violence cases than in, in ordinary civil cases. In, in ordinary civil cases, you know, plaintiffs, not surprisingly, bear the burden of proof, right? If a, a plaintiff is making a claim, it's the plaintiff's responsibility to prove um, the claim. But in, in domestic violence cases, the burden of proof actually is supposed to shift to, to the defendant to, to prove that the plaintiff's claims are, are false. Um, but but in, in practice, um, the, um, uh, and, and this is sort of all, all over the place in, in di different parts of, uh, of Chinese law, um, but in, in practice, um, judges ignore these provisions calling on shifting the burden of proof to defendants. Um, in, instead, they, um, they, they, they apply the ordinary um, standard of evidence and, and kind of force plaintiffs to, um, to bear the burden of proof, and, and, um, and which is impossible, um, you know, because given the, um, uh, the, the basically, you know, the, um, uh, the strategy that I just described, um, you know, even when judges affirm as factual the allegations of domestic violence, they'll say, well, sure, but you haven't proven the breakdown of, of mutual uh, affection. Um, plaintiffs will, will submit all kinds of evidence. They submit medical documentation um, of domestic violence, of injuries um, sustained. I mean, really gruesome, um, just harrowing um, stuff. Um, you know, the, the detail uh, in, in these court decisions um, is, is, um, uh, is really something. Photos, police reports, documentation from residence committees or work units, police warnings, personal protection orders, and, uh, and pledge letters. So what are these pledge letters? Um, they're like, um, you know, Bao Zheng Shu is, is one, or Cheng Nuo Shu, or, uh, or, or, you know, so you can translate them as, as apology letters or promise letters or guarantee letters. Um, they're, they're essentially, and here's an example of, uh, of one of them. These are very, very common in, um, in divorce cases in, in China. Um, this is, they're essentially confession letters. Uh, and the Supreme People's Court, and you can see if you, if you can read Chinese and you can read, read this letter, um, the, uh, the defendant in this case, um, you know, is, is admitting that he beat uh, his wife and he's, he's apologizing. That's how he opens the letter writing to his, his wife named Min. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I did something, you know, un, unforgivable and, the, and, and uh, I, I, I beat you. And he's, he's seeking forgiveness and seeking mercy, seeking another chance. Um, and uh, the Supreme People's Court has been very clear on how judges are supposed to um, treat uh, pledge letters like this. They're supposed to treat them as evidence of domestic violence and therefore as the basis of rulings to grant divorces, right, on fault-based grounds, so using the fault um, doctrine. Um, but uh, in practice, judges tend to do exactly the opposite. Um, they tend to uh, focus on the contrition of the uh, of, of the abuser, and uh, and they'll tell the they'll tell the plaintiff, um, look, he he's apologizing, um, he loves you, he wants another chance, he's unwilling uh, to to divorce. So judges uh, overwhelmingly use letters like this to disaffirm the breakdown of mutual affection rather than to affirm the breakdown of mutual um, uh, uh, affection. You know, according to the laws, it shouldn't be that hard to get divorced if you make a compelling claim of domestic violence and support it with evidence. But in practice, it's it's almost impossible. Um, it just it just doesn't matter um, what the basis of your claim um, for for divorce is. Um, so as as Jean mentioned, you know, I, I collected um, a, a lot of court decisions um, on divorce from a collection of almost of, of over four and a half million. Um, I, uh, I analyzed close to 150,000 um, divorce um, 
decisions um, in, in Hunan and Zhejiang. So I'll just sort of skip over that. Uh, Jean also mentioned that they, the, the court decisions cover the period of 2009 to uh, 2016. That's when uh, the Supreme People's Court um, ordered courts to stop posting divorce decisions online. So it's, it's basically become impossible to analyze divorce decisions after October 2016, which is, which is when the new regulations, the rules and regulations on posting court decisions online went into effect. Um, all right, so some alarming findings. Um, about 25% of all divorce petitions were filed by women making domestic violence um, allegations. Um, if we just look at women, it's, it's more like 40%. It's almost 40% of women's um, petitions uh, included claims of marital abuse. And women um, accounted for almost 70% of, of all plaintiffs. So, you know, the, the, uh, a sizable majority of divorce petitions or uh, divorces were initiated by, by women. Um, of all divorce petitions containing domestic violence allegations, fewer than 2% were granted on this basis. Some were granted, but for other reasons. Usually if, if the defendant happened to consent or if the defendant was a no-show, right, was AWOL, just didn't show up to, to defend himself, that really boosted women's chances of, of successfully uh, divorcing. Courts denied the vast majority of divorce petitions containing domestic violence allegations, 72% in Hunan, 86% in, uh, in, in Zhejiang. Um, you know, I did, I did a, a lot of, you know, this is, I'm giving a, a qualitative presentation today, but the book contains a lot of quantitative um, analysis. And um, I did, you know, a lot of statistical analysis um, and um, a, a domestic violence claim the, the results are very, very clear across all kinds of analyses, just makes no difference. It does not increase the probability of a success, successful divorce petition. Um, judges just simply don't care. Um, they may care as individuals, right? At sort of a personal level, but um, um, but it, 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 you know there, there are other things um, that matter more to judges. Um, so basically, what what happens, and you know, very quickly, um, you know, women seeking to divorce usually can eventually get divorced. It's just not on the first try. So divorce litigation kind of becomes like a groundhog day. It's just like. Uh, and this is why I often characterize Chinese divorce litigation as Sisyphean, right? So plaintiffs seeking divorce in court are like Sisyphus. It's like this uphill slog, right? Pushing the boulder up the hill and then, and then it rolls back down and they have to do it all over again. Um, it's sometimes it takes two, three, four, five tries before they can eventually succeed. Um, and uh, uh, I call this a divorce twofer. I mean, most of the time, um, if a plaintiff goes back for a second try, they can get their divorce granted on the second try. So the twofer refers to kind of two for the price of one, but that's not for the, from the plaintiff's perspective. That's from the judge's um, perspective. And I'll, I'll explain um, what, I, what I mean by that. I mean, I mean how is this possible? Um, basically, the civil procedure law um, in China uh, includes a special exception for divorce cases, which kind of resets um, the litigation so that after, when a divorce petition is denied, then um, a, uh, a six month waiting period, there's a statutory waiting period that, that, that begins. Uh, after the six month statutory waiting period, either litigant can then refile a brand new first instance um, petition. So it's, it's like the the, uh, the original decision never happened. It's not an appeal. So it's not a second instance um, petition. It's, an, it's a new first instance petition. Um, most civil cases um, you know, are not eligible um, for this sort of litigation do-over. Only divorce cases are, are eligible for a do-over. Um, so um, judges basically, you know, they, they send um, the plaintiffs home. They say, sorry, you know, you're, um, you're not getting divorced today. Um, but if you guys, you know, get all your ducks in a row, all your affairs in order, if the two of you can come to an agreement on uh, property division, child custody, and you, you come back uh, after the six month waiting period, then I'll be inclined to, uh, to grant your, your divorce. And, and that's sort of the two for the price of one, because then judges, um, they're kind of, they're, they're clearing their dockets very quickly. They're kind of gaming the 
performance evaluation system, they're getting uh, credit for two cases, right? For, for one case, they're getting credit for two. That's what I mean by kind of the, the, the twofer. Um, they're getting rewarded on their annual reviews for, for more volume, right? Higher volume of cases, but very efficient, right? Processing of cases, short case closing times. Um, and, and if they promise the litigants that, uh, you know, on the next try or the third try, they'll grant the divorce, um, then the, plan, the, uh, the litigants are very unlikely to appeal the outcome and, and judges get punished for, for appeals, right, on their, their uh, performance evaluation. So there are a lot of incentives for, for judges to deny um, these, um, these, these petitions. I just mentioned that heavy caseloads. So I have a whole chapter, um, actually two chapters on, uh, on, on heavy caseloads as, as a reason why, why judge, they, they, you know, um, they, they used uh, divorce cases to clear their dockets. It just may, it lightens their, their workloads. I mentioned the performance um, uh, evaluations. Um, of course, you know, performance evaluations are not limited to case volume and efficiency and appeal rates. Um, they also include social stability measures. Um, you know, judges like um, government officials and civil servants throughout the uh, government bureaucracy um, are tasked with um, you know, with with um, maintaining stability, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the overriding task, you know, way when. Um, and um, and so they're, they're also, um, you know, they're worried that um, uh, that that a litigant, you know, either the plaintiff or the um, uh, or the defendant will will complain, uh, will or, or petition um, or, or worse yet, um, kind of seek private um, Retribution or vengeance, um, and um, you know, and and uh, and and that would really harm uh, the judge's course, uh, sort of performance evaluations. Judges are also um, deeply concerned about their own um, personal safety. So you know, it's it's not uncommon um, for you know they, they see women coming into court, right, making claims of of domestic violence, and and judges are are like, wow, okay, so this guy, you know, there's evidence. I see this guy, you know, is a wife beater. Um, he's violent. He has a, a you know documented history of of violence. He, he and and what what if he gets angry at me? Um, and some litigants even threaten uh, uh, judges. Um, and I'll I'll come back to that uh, in, in in a minute if I uh, if I have time. Political ideology is uh, is is another reason. Um, you know, Xi Jinping has um, kind of re revived and renewed ideological calls to maintain family stability as a means of maintaining social and, and political stability uh, uh, more, more generally and sort of promoting socialist family values um, as, as part of the, the larger agenda of promoting core socialist values, right? Family values is promoting socialist, uh, core socialist values, promoting the family, strengthening the family as a way of strengthening the, the nation. Um, and, but, but of course, um, patriarchal cultural values come into play uh, as, as well. Um, the you know, judges, this, this pattern of denying divorce um, petitions um, is not applied equally to, uh, to female and male um, plaintiffs. Um, overall, on the, the, the probability of success on the first try in Hunan was only 25%, only 18% in, uh, in Zhejiang, but the gap between male and female plaintiffs was huge uh, in both places. Um, on the second try, or sort of uh, not just second, on, on all subsequent tries kind of put together, um, the probability of success was much, much higher, about the same, 75% uh, in Hunan and 76% in, in Zhejiang. And actually on subsequent tries, women were a little more likely than men uh, to, to succeed. Um, I'm gonna skip um, over you know, the media coverage of some, some um, cases of domestic violence and divorce litigation that were covered by, um, by the media uh, in China uh, and, and outside of China uh, as well. Um, I'm, I'm already kind of running out of time, but the, the, the point that I wanted to make is that, I mean, these are truly horrific um, cases um, and they, they seem extreme um, and um, they, they seem kind of like aberrations, right? They're covered in the media and, and might appear to be anomalous. Um, and, but, you know, after reading hundreds and hundreds of cases and analyzing quantitatively, um, you know, tens of thousands of cases, I, I, I can say that 
they're unusual only in their publicity. You know, these cases like, like these are utterly common. Um, and, it, you know, if only, if only people knew how common the, these, these cases like these that have been covered in the media uh, are. There, I mean, thousands of similar cases are, they're hiding in plain sight. I mean, they're in, in online repositories of court decisions. They're right there um, for people uh, to, to, to read. Um, I'm gonna, gonna skip over, over this sort of, you know, common justifications. I mean, the one thing that judges really focus on is, is defendants' unwillingness to, to divorce. Um, if, if a defendant with, withholds consent, um, even if there's strong and compelling evidence of domestic violence, um, judges will say, well, look, that the, the, you know, your husband's unwillingness to divorce proves that uh, mutual affection has not broken down and that there's still hope for reconciliation and that you have therefore failed uh, to meet the standard, right, the legal standard for divorce. Um, and I'm thereby, there, therefore denying your divorce request. Um, so you can, you know, ubiquitous language. This is sort of everywhere throughout uh, judges holdings in their, in their decisions. The defendant does not consent to divorce and still desires to preserve the marriage, which proves that there is still reconciliation potential right out of that 1989 um, Supreme People's Court judicial interpretation. Um, and here we have a judge, you know, saying, uh, on the record, when I first started working, I followed the practice of all courts by denying first attempt divorce petitions. During the initial trial, so long as none of the statutory con conditions for divorce were, were met, the instant, and, and I should say that even, even when statutory conditions for divorce are met, right, like domestic violence, the instant I heard the words, I do not consent to divorce, I could start twiddling my thumbs. Seriously, from that point on, I could stop listening and go straight to an adjudicated denial. Um, this is a case that was um, that was covered. This is from the secondary literature, and uh, in the interests of time, I'll just jump straight to some some case examples um, from my my sample. So, in this case, let's look at the um, at what the what the plaintiff included in her petition, right? Her legal complaint, right? The the, the um, uh, supporting her uh, her request to the court um, for a divorce. Um, she was hospitalized. Um, after the defendant caused a concussion and chest hemorrhaging. And then, and then a few years later, she was hospitalized again after the defendant cut her with the, the glass lining of a hot water thermos and smashed her over the head with a beer bottle, causing a cerebral hematoma. And then a year after that, she was hospitalized again um, with a broken nose, a fractured eye socket, an ear contusion, and head and chest wounds. Um, and she, she submitted as evidence, right, to support these, these claims, um, police and hospital documentation. Um, the defendant just simply said, I do not consent to divorce. Marital relations are good. Um, both sides occasionally argue, but afterwards were as good as new. Um, and then the court in its holding, right, that's sort of its rationale or, or like legal reasoning, its justification for its decision, um, it said in, in just an epic um, understatement, I mean, this is an example of gaslighting. In recent years, some conflict has emerged over family trifles. You know, jia ting suo, sure, is the, the, uh, the term that's used ubiquitously. Last year, the defendant was on the extreme side of contentious, but mutual affection has not declined to the level of complete breakdown. Um, and, and the divorce petition was, was denied. Um, in, in another case, the court held that although in the course of living together, husband and wife have become angry about household chores and other minor life matters, and beatings have occurred as a result, so admitting that there have been beatings, um, although it's sort of like presented here as, as, it's, it, as if it's like mutual um, beating, um, these, these beatings have been rare and do not constitute domestic violence and therefore do not prove that mutual affection has indeed um, broken down. So this is another example of, of gaslighting, right? Just recasting um, a, uh, what a plaintiff understands to be a toxically abusive marriage as you know, fundamentally healthy and hopeful um, as a pretext for forcibly preserving uh, yeah, I mean, judges will, 
will we'll often so together with, with family members who are also opposed to the divorce, they'll say, oh, this is, this is very typical. It's very common. You know, every marriage has its problem. You know, there's nothing special about, about your marriage. Um, every marriage goes through, you know, uh, there are bumps in the road. And if you just, you know, if you really cherish your marriage and, and, and are committed to working through this and improve your communication skills, you can overcome this and reconcile and be happy and, uh, and live to be old and gray. I mean, this is the sort of the therapeutic language that judges use. I mean, they, they actually uh, behave like um, marital counselors and therapists. Um, in another holding, you know, the judges wrote, um, although the defendant occasionally beat and cursed the plaintiff, there is no evidence that his acts of beating and berating the plaintiff were frequent and persistent or that they caused serious consequences, and they therefore do not constitute domestic violence, and, and the judges denied the, um, the plaintiff's uh, petition. Um, in, in all of these cases, um, the judges had solid legal grounds for, for, di for granting uh, the divorce, but they, they, uh, they chose not to. Um, here, a, a defendant, and it's, it's actually not uncommon for defendants you know, on the record um, in, in court, uh, will, will, will state to the judges you know, that, they, you know, that, that they beat their wives. Um, here, the, the defendant said, I admit smashing the window on the front door of the plaintiff's family home, but I did it because I couldn't get in. Um, on, on November uh, 16th, 2015, I, I slapped the plaintiff um, four times. Uh, I only hit the plaintiff once on November 22nd, 2015, because she pulled a disappearing act and even transferred her cell phone number. And then some, some more stuff. And uh, 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 you know, when she said she was sure she wanted to do this and go ahead with the divorce, I hit her. This is the best way to deal with her. This is in the written court decision. This is what the defendant, you know, said on the court um, to the to the judges, um, and and it's not uncommon uh, at all. One of the cases that got some media uh, coverage, you know, the the defendant was the husband was explaining um, in 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 court and to, and to the media that. You know, he was not going to let this divorce happen because he had invested so much in the bride price. He wanted to get his money's worth, um, and and uh, and so you know he had to he had to change his wife's perspective. He had to kind of show her who's who's boss. Get our lian is what 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 he uh, uh, what he, what he said. Um, like so similar to what this husband said, it's the best way uh, to deal with her. And, and uh, in, in all of these cases, the judges, they just kind of go along with it. Um, in here, the court actually held, you know, in its written court decision, the defendant slapped the plaintiff five times and punched her head once. The plaintiff reported the incident to the police, so it was documented. Um, she admitted herself to the hospital, because clearly the, the husband didn't, uh, didn't take her to the hospital, uh, was diagnosed with an, a, a head, an internal head injury, external head contusions, um, her husband was, the police even picked up the husband, detained him, uh, punished him, um, and stated that the defendant had beaten the plaintiff with an open hand and closed fist, causing a minor injury to the right side of the plaintiff's um, face. But the evidence does not prove that marital affection has indeed broken down. There's in, insufficient evidence to support the plaintiff's petition, and the court therefore denies support of it. And, and note again, a pledge letter. The defendant addressed this. He promised never again to beat the plaintiff, that he would work hard and take care of his family um, from this day forward. The defendant should avoid the occurrence of events like these, control his feelings, show greater care and concern for the plaintiff and her family. If the plaintiff and defendant strengthen understanding and trust, are more considerate and tolerant of each other, put the interests of their family and children first, their marriage can still be reconciled. This is utterly typical. There's, there's, there's nothing unusual about this sort of case. There are thousands and thousands um, just, uh, just like it. And I could, I could go on um, and, and, and on. And in some of these cases, you know, the, the plaintiff uh, filed, you know, for divorce three, four, five times. Um, and, and sometimes the, the, the courts will, will continue to deny uh, the, uh, the, the petitions. It's, it's already, um, 545, you know, I, I think you're getting, getting the point here. I mean, this is, this is a pattern. Um, 
And, and when, um, when, when judges deny divorce petitions like these, um, the delay, the average delay to a successful divorce, right? So this is when the plaintiff then waits the statutory, um, the waiting period, the six month waiting period, it, 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 you know, usually takes, it, it adds about one year on average to the, the time to a successful divorce, during which time, of course, the, the plaintiff is exposed to, you know, ongoing abuse, to further uh, violence. And sometimes they have to um, as escape, they go, in, they go into hiding. Um, sometimes um, civil cases become criminal cases. I have a whole chapter, chapter nine in the book um, is about, um, when divorce cases become criminal cases, either when the, the husband um, murders the wife, um, you know, after a uh, uh, after she unsuccessfully attempted to divorce him, um, or when the the wife murders the husband in self defense. Um, this is not uncommon um, at, at all. Sometimes, um, in order to kind of seal the deal, um, to get the husband to consent um, to divorce and to increase the likelihood of a su successful outcome. Um, women will accept raw deals, right, by um, giving up property claims um, and, and child custody um, in exchange um, for, for, for divorce. Um, so clearly I don't have time to talk about child custody and that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stop here um, and would be happy to um, take questions and hear your comments and uh, uh, from from the audience. So thank you very much. Great, Ethan. That was uh, incredibly disturbing uh, <laughs> findings, but <clears throat> very important. I um, There's so many things. I can't wait to, to really read the book. And it's amazing. It's great that we can get our, our online copy. Um, I wanted to, to um, ask, because it's because my questions before you put um, up your your empirical findings, I was thinking that perhaps well you know, um, Zhejiang is a richer province and and perhaps you know the outcome might be different because they're more they're more developed and I assume then that there's no difference between urban and rural either, right? Oh no, there there are massive differences between urban and rural, China. but but the the. So actually the, you know, what I call the judicial clampdown on divorce, right? This tendency and, and increasing tendency, by the way, I didn't, I didn't talk about change over time, but there's been an increasing tendency to deny um, divorce petitions in, in, in recent years. That's actually been, been um, kind of harsher um, in Zhejiang than in Hunan. That, that's surprising. It's sort of paradoxical for the reasons you just mentioned. I mean, Zhejiang is a it's a it's a relatively prosperous yes. uh, coastal um, province, one of the most uh, economically dynamic parts of uh, of China. You know, it's part of the um, the the Yangtze uh, Delta uh, region, and and obviously has you know stronger ties to kind of world society. And you know, Hunan, um, by contrast, is a uh, relatively poor agricultural kind of interior um, province. It, it exports a lot of um, uh, a lot of migrant workers actually to, to Zhejiang and Guangdong mm -hmm. and places places like that. So so it, you know it's sort of surprising that uh, that 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 Hunan you know that that judges are more willing to grant divorces in Hunan than in than but, in Zhejiang. But you said you said there is lots of differences. So are they less willing in rural areas or is it actually in urban areas that they're less so, willing to grant? Well, okay. So the, the sorry, the the I need to be I need to be clear um, about that. So the, on on the the issue of like willingness to grant the divorce, um, actually there are not huge differences between urban and rural um, courts. Actually, urban courts are a, a, it's actually a little bit harder to uh, to get divorced in the urban courts than in the in the rural courts. And the reason is simple. It's because it's the you know Zhejiang's courts. Have way higher, um, like way heavier dockets than than. So this is all. This is fascinating about the judges, their incentives, and this is just a, a sort of a, in a sense, sort of more bureaucratic um, strategies for getting ahead and making their jobs easier. But but then that raises the question, of does, for example, the women's association, ever intervene? I mean, the, the, this is. I'm sure that that that. Um, 
those in China, the leadership, do they know this? Is this, or is this really something that no one has ever actually um, documented? That's that's a, a, a great a great um, uh, question. But um, but before before I answer that question, just to like the the um, so there's a distinction. Obviously, I mean the the contrast between Zhejiang and, and Hunan is 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 huge and. Um, and and it's it's explained pretty much entirely by differences in the workloads of judges. I mean, uh, judge, judges in Zhejiang uh, have much much heavier caseloads than than judges in, in Hunan. So judges in Zhejiang are looking for any reason, any excuse to just like close a divorce case and then and move on to the next case. The differences, but I mentioned before that there are um, urban rural differences. Uh, that has to do with the gender differences. So I see. Um, the gender differences are are massive. Um, are really like so so um, women's um, much lower chances of success um, are limited to rural courts. Um, that does not extend like to uh, to urban courts. Child custody outcomes as well. Um, Women um, have a much, much lower chance than men of, of succeeding, of getting child custody, um, particularly of sons. But that, that's limited to, uh, to rural courts as well. That does not extend to urban courts. Actually, in urban courts, women fare a little bit better uh, in terms of child custody uh, outcomes. So those are the, so the, you know, some of the main urban-rural uh, differences. But the provincial differences, I mean, are, are really quite, quite dramatic. Um, yes, the uh, the All China Women's Federation, you know, does get involved and is is actually, I mean, this is one of its its tasks. Part of it, you know, its mandate is to is to uh, is to help women um, in in situations like mm -hmm. this. But um, but but they, you know, it, it fails. Um, they they often send women home. I mean, they're really part of the um, part of this gaslighting phenomenon. Um, the you know, women across China report, and it's, it's not just, you know, I, I, I couldn't, um, I didn't do any field work, by the way. In your introduction, you were very kind and mentioned my, my experience doing field work. I did zero field work for this, this project. I mean, in, in some ways, this was the ideal kind of pandemic um, project. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't interview a single Well, you're guy. excused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I didn't... but yeah, let me just sort of ask a different question related to this and i guess this was if I, I can't remember now so it's but recently there was like outrage about this caged woman the the the, the is i mean given given this and given the horrendous conditions and the treatment these women were subject to was there i mean do you do you see any because you have that chapter on the media but i guess what people aren't weren't highlighting it or are things censored or was there like and I guess the bigger picture I question I have is so what is the response from the party so you say that Xi Jinping you know tries to to you know strengthen the family and all of this but given what's happening to the family isn't the party held responsible in any way um I you know, I, my sense um, is that the general public is not fully aware of, you know, the sheer ubiquity of, of this phenomenon of, you know, sort of the routine denial of divorce petitions uh, in, in courts, uh, even those involving um, strong um, claims of domestic violence you know, supported by, by evidence. Um, I think if if the public were aware that this is just you know a, a routine phenomenon, um, an everyday phenomenon, and and that the cases that they do hear, I mean, so that the cases that I listed that I didn't have time to uh, to discuss, um, sparked you know nationwide public outrage and and actually forced courts to to grant divorces that they had they had initially denied. Um, and and so if the and this is one of my motivations for making the book um, open access was to to make it accessible to um, to legal scholars um, to to reporters to anybody in China who who otherwise would have difficulty um, accessing the book and uh, just just to show 
just how, how prevalent um, this, this practice is um, in, in courts, um, you know, in, in all 250 courts in, in both provinces. Um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe, anyway, I, I, I don't know if it'll change anything. <laughs> I don't know if anybody will, will pay attention, but I, I, I would like people to pay attention to this and I, I would like this to exert some kind of pressure um, and, to, and to change judi judicial practices. So also, I mean, the, the one other sort of obvious question is, did you find any variation um, in, in, in terms of whether the judge was male or female? I assume that the majority were men, but do you, are, do you have access to know if the judges were male or female? Not with um, perfect accuracy, but you can get like the, the judges' names uh, are on all the court decisions. Um, and and so you can infer the gender of the of the judge from the name, but but again, not with perfect accuracy. There, there's you know some names are are kind of gender ambiguous, um, but you know there are there are um, algorithms out there. You know there 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 is computer code um, uh, that's publicly available, and I, I used some of it to you know I ran all the judges' names um, through these. They're called like gender guessers, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and I and I was looking for uh, for for differences by the sex of the of the judges. Um, some of these cases um, were decided by single judges, right? So it's like one they're like one judge panels, um, and some of the cases were decided by three judge panels. Um, some of the some of the cases were decided by panels of three that included only one or two judges plus. Um, one or two lay assessors. So there would be a three person panel um, and lay assessors are, are commonly uh, used. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to kind of, to try and measure or assess the, the effect of, you know, the, the gender of the, um, you know, are there, are there any women on the panel or any, any judges who are women or does the, do, do lay assessors even matter? And I mean, I looked for everything. I looked for, I, I was really looking for, for, for effect and I found nothing. And, and all of my um, statistical analysis controls for the, um, the gender composition of the judges. So, so the, the effects that I report are net of these, these controls. Um, but you know, looking at the coefficients, we, I, I don't report the coefficients in the book um, for judge sex because they just they're, they're, there are no effects. They, it makes no difference. And this is actually what some of the Secondary literature in the, in the Chinese language literature reports as well that that women judges um, are no more well may, maybe they're some more sympathetic than male. Actually, I'm, I'm I'm quite certain they would be you know personally at a personal level more sympathetic um, to uh, female abuse victims seeking divorce, but they, they their um, decision making is no different. Um, than that of their male counterparts. They're, they're just as likely as male judges to deny divorce petitions. So meaning that, and, and it may be one possibility is that they feel more vulnerable than male judges do to, you know, the kind of the threats and intimidation of, of violent husbands. Hmm. It's fascinating. So the, I guess that, you know, knowing what I do about um, the bureaucracy in, in China, and that you know, local officials they had to change the the criteria by which local officials were um, evaluated annually in order to get a change in behavior with regarding to certain things like you know um, uh, pollution and 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 what they would emphasize. So clearly, the the one of the takeaways from your work is they need to do something about the, the caseload and also how judges are evaluated. Has anybody, has this ever been discussed? I mean, judges themselves, I understand are becoming sort of more professional and sort of pursuing their interest. Is there any, any signs that they themselves might try to do something? Well, the, the Chinese judiciary has had a problem recruiting and retaining uh, judges yes. and, and so, and it's gotten worse. There's a, a recent, um, you know, quota, ref, a judge quota reform. So the Faguan Yuan Zhi Gai Ge, meaning that, and and actually the, I mean, the problem has been a shortage of judges. I mean, the, this basic problem of overworked judges and their heavy mm. caseloads, their mm. heavy dockets, is known in Chinese as the An Duo Ren Shao. It's too many, 
too many cases and too few too judges. Yes. Um, and so, but but rather than recruiting more judges, the Yuanzhi guy it actually cut the number of judges. It reduced the number of judges by by about forty percent. So, um, you know, it made the problem worse. It aggravated the problem. I mean, I, I think what wow. what the the court system really needs to do is is to is to make you know, the being a judge, a more attractive um, profession, um, raise salaries, improve working conditions, um, make it safer, and, and recruit more judges. But but it did exactly the opposite. Although it did the opposite for the the motivation that uh, that you just mentioned to professionalize, you know, the um, the judiciary to make it more of a like an elite, more exclusive right. elite right. profession, improve the quality of, uh, of of judges. But now judges are, I mean. There have been some reforms aimed at making it easier for judges to do their work. So, um, you know, uh, having clerks, judge clerks, for example, you know, assist with the preparation of cases, and you know, a lot of the kind of grunt work that judges used to have to do. Now that now they can, their clerks can do that. Um, artificial intelligence is is being introduced to kind of streamline the mm -hmm. decision making process. And um, so, so. But you're you're 100 right. I, I I think that you know we, we, somebody has to has to devise um, you know incentives right to um, for for judges to help women and to protect women to to make it easier for women to get out of these abusive and very dangerous um, situations. Well, this is a just absolutely fascinating, incredibly rich uh, research and very important. And thank you for making it open access. I I do hope that it um make this better known especially in china um unfortunately our time is up even though we have many more questions uh but so thank you very much and congratulations on the uh, publication of this very important book thank you and thank, thank you. the audience thank thanks you. very much okay bye-bye bye-bye